Ladies and gentlemen on the other side of the screen, welcome to Demo Day of the Challenger Accelerator. My name is Kristina Korčeková and I will be your guide tonight. We are happy to have you here, albeit even only virtually, and there might be a laser show if we are lucky. Since last October, the seven startups that you will see pitching here tonight have been working nonstop on improving and validating their business propositions, their investability, and their presentation skills. They have participated to numerous coaching and mentoring sessions and various workshops. They have already pitched many times in front of investors, corporate leaders, and some of the more successful of their startup peers. And tonight, with this demo day, we are hoping to further celebrate, recognize, and reward these hardworking people that are behind the seven startups and to help them promote their solutions to a larger audience, which I hope is on the other side of this camera. At the beginning, there were 12 of them. Tonight, you will see the best seven pitching. And we have also a whole blockbuster program prepared for you. Altogether, we have more than two and a half hours of program filled with inspirational and hopefully aspirational speeches and chats by and with some of the most successful of CEE's entrepreneurs. And of course, the seven pitches of the sustainability solutions, because the first year of Challenger Accelerator 2021 has been dedicated to accelerating sustainability solutions. On agenda first is this hopefully hearty welcome from me, from Peter Kolesar, partner at Civita Slovakia, and from Matuš Valo, mayor of the city of Bratislava, one of many Challenger's supporters, and dare I say, Challenger-in-chief in the city. Opening keynote speech will be delivered by Martin Willig, co-founder at Bolt, that you must know. He will be talking about the story of his unicorn, from the beginning to its global success. He will also touch upon how COVID has changed Bolt, but also mobility at large. As for our aspirational or inspirational content, we are also very excited to host a fireside chat with Peter Komornik, co-founder and CEO of Slido, and Michala Kryszkova, one of the founders of Startup Awards and former investment manager at the first Slovak VC fund, Neology Ventures. What they will be talking about is Slido's success from the beginning at a startup weekend all the way to an acquisition by Cisco. However, one could not call tonight a demo day if it wasn't for its key ingredient, that is the pitching. And where there is pitching, there is a jury. Our Magnificent Seven will pitch in front of a jury made of four people. Miriana Krolo, Chief Operations Officer at IPTQ by Swiss Re. Eamon Carey, Managing Director at Techstars London. Michal Nespor, partner and uh, founder of CB Investment Management, and Rivo Anton, founding partner at United Angels VC. He is hailing also from Estonia. The jury will decide which of the startups deserves of the main prize, and that is an investment opportunity of 250,000 euros provided by CB Investment Management. But do not worry. We also have space for democracy. So there is a People's Choice Award that you, the audience, will be given an opportunity to decide. At the end of the pitching block, you will be voting using Slido. Now, the winner of this award uh, will be awarded by a service package put together by the innovation consultancy Civita, the law firm Majerniga Mihalikova, and the co-working space the spot. Running a successful and most of all meaningful acceleration program is impossible without friends and without partners. We are humbled 
the Challenger Accelerator has been placed under the auspices of the President of the Slovak Republic, Madame Zuzana Chaputova. We thank her office for this support. We further thank our unicorn partner, Swiss Re, our growth partner, Microsoft, our seed partners, Majerniga Mihalikova, Slovak Investment Holding, Slovak Business Agency, and Zapadoslovenska Energetika. The program has been developed and run in cooperation with Slovak American Foundation, in now Interreg Central Europe, Vienna Business Agency, and EIT Climate Kick. And finally, this event is also supported, well, the whole program is supported by the city of Bratislava and by Bratislava self-governing region. And there is a media partner, Žive SK, which is live streaming this event as we speak. Now, at this point, let me welcome on the stage Peter Kolesar, partner at Civita Slovakia, Challenger's key organizer, I can say. Hello, Peter. Hi, Kika. Thank you. Thank you very much. And welcome, everybody. These are difficult times, uh, but we're very happy that we can meet at least virtually out of this cool studio and present you some of the most impressive startups in sustainability. We have launched the Challenger as a startup acceleration platform for aspiring entrepreneurs in Central and Eastern Europe. Building on our experience working with startups and entrepreneurs in countries like Estonia, Lithuania, to Slovakia, Ukraine, or Albania, and getting inspired by some of the best programs supporting entrepreneurs in the world. Our mission at Challenger is to help entrepreneurs grow and succeed, but also to serve as a catalyst for the new economy, for the new for the economy to come, for the economy based on knowledge, and in this part of the world. But this is only a part of it. This demo day, this challenger program is only one piece of the puzzle, one part of larger ambitions to make an impact in this part of the world. We are planning to launch more programs like this, more challenger programs uh, in the coming weeks and months. We'll be launching challenger urban and creative out of Kosice, Slovakia. We'll be launching Challenger Artificial Intelligence out of Ukraine. And we'll be also launching Challenger focused on supporting the diversity of founders out of Estonia. We're also planning several other initiatives that will help founders exchange knowledge and also scale internationally. And we'll be also, also launching initiatives that will help connect different ecosystems around Europe. So stay tuned for more information to come. But this program is a, is a truly international effort. There were Civita experts from six countries that helped put this together, and many more mentors, experts, coaches, workshop leads uh, that helped deliver what we believe is a, is a world-class content. So I would like to thank all of them for their time, commitment, and energy. Without you, this would not be possible. Because only a strong partnership can uh, help make functioning ecosystem and make deliver lasting change. So that's why we're not only partnering with VC funds, foundations, but also leading corporates and the public sector. Because it is now, these days especially, where we need to see and hear from the public sector, from the governments, about the importance of innovation, about the importance of science, because the governments, because governments around the world can help mobilize capital, talent, and also support systems for entrepreneurs. And municipalities also globally can be engines for the creative class, for tech entrepreneurs, and frequently more so than national governments. And that's why it's very encouraging to see that the city of Bratislava has been trying to actively engage with the community of innovators through testing out new, idea, new ideas, new solutions, digitalizing the municipality, and also opening data to the public and to the community of innovators. And that's why it is with great pleasure that I would like to welcome here on this virtual stage the mayor of Bratislava and the fresh candidate for their 
for the World Mayor Award, Mr. Matusz Valo. Mr. Mayor Matusz, welcome. It is great to have you with us on stage and in this uh, special evening for, for all of us. Uh, but the times are very challenging and very difficult, especially for municipalities and for cities around the country. Uh, you must be exhausted with everything that's going on. How, how are you feeling? How are you managing? Thank you very much. I'm glad I can be here with you. Uh, yeah, I mean, everybody knows what's going on. The times are difficult for everybody. Uh, we are trying to hold up, holding up. What I'm actually doing, I'm trying to not to stop to doing what we wanted to do in the first place during these four years because of COVID-19. So uh, we, did, we, did, we split our teams in two different teams and only one is dealing with COVID. Other one, uh, other one is dealing with everything else and we are trying to really move on to, to move this city. And I'm, I'm happy and unlucky that I, I'm in both teams. So I'm really kind of tired, that's true. Yeah, so turning more on the topic of, of this evening, innovation and entrepreneurship, two of the key principles of Magnet Cities are attracting young wealth creators and, and cultivating new ideas. And I remember you coming to our Accelerator Demo Day two years ago, just days after being elected to your office, talking about your vision about Bratislava as a, as a laboratory of new ideas, as a testing ground, but also as a beneficiary of innovations. And uh, I have to say that we have seen a lot of effort put into that. Some of our startups have piloted solutions with the city of Bratislava for the first time. We have seen a big hackathon on sustainable solutions. So what are you personally, what are the changes that, that you have brought to, uh, to Bratislava and where do you think you have succeeded so far? Thank you very much. I need to say, two years ago, I, I maybe first time um, opened up the idea to have own uh, chief innovation officer. And today, after two years, I'm very glad that we have Peter Zurov in this uh, in th this role, which is the first time in ever in history of our city. Uh, and I'm happy to see the, the growth of the innovative ecosystem in Bratislava and. Uh, the things I really value, which is cooperation between the, the city and startups and private sector. Uh, we have our policy Bratislava City Lab, which allows testing uh, of any new solution uh, in our live city environment. That's very important for us. We we'll have launched first mobility project, a pilot, pilot project to understand the flow of the city traffic. That's very important as well. And uh, we are doing also the project with two companies to test parking sensors as a part of our citywide parking policy. Uh, I mean, the big step for our city, not maybe in terms of international uh, level of it, is that we, we are collecting data, uh, making an evaluation of the data, and we managed to launch the British city uh, uh, British open data portal, and which now we have more than 10,000 sets of data and I think it's growing and it's it's a bigger step for better uh, data decision making and transparency. What, what I'm uh, I'm very happy also for a cooperation with Bloomberg Philanthropies. That's very important for us. I'm a part of a of a Bloomberg Harvard City Leadership Initiative, which is supported, which uh, support us through the the COVID crisis as well. Along my executive education and support to city senior staff, we are going. We are a part of Innovation Track. Uh, you are maybe probably familiar with the, the, the design thinking process. However, it's fairly new when it comes to city management, and uh, and uh, I, it was very interesting to see how the problems we perceive, like important, uh, are completely um, put in different uh, views by citizens. Uh, last year, we have started a digital transformation program with FutureGov. Uh, uh, it's a good digital service, are one piece of the puzzle, of course, and we, we kind of have a lot of, a lot of work in this, this side. Great. So, so looking in, into the future, let's say 2030, you are finishing your third term as a mayor of Bratislava. Where do you see uh, the city in the area, let's say, of innovation and entrepreneurship? Uh, maybe 
compared to other startup ecosystems like Brno, like Krakow, Vienna or Budapest, or in collaboration with them? What, what's your vision for 2030? I mean, the, the, the triangle, uh, for me, the main triangle, of course, is an uh, intensive cooperation between academic, business sector, and, of course, the, the municipality. That's very important for us. And uh, this triangle provides space for project and the priority areas in the sustainable mobility, adaptation to the climate change, of course, live, uh, livability and digital services. That's, that's a pivotal for me. Uh, we are looking at the city like a, like the whole the whole uh, in in a holistic way and uh, and that's very important resilient cities for me are the ones uh, that look into social uh, economic and environmental sustainability as well as a good governance so uh, more we pro uh, more years are come uh, the future is uh, is is behind the doors let's say behind the corners that's the only way how to deal with it is to to uh, consider it all the levels of, of the of the city and uh, and its development. Uh -huh. So one last question: Do you have a, an initiative that you saw somewhere else in some other city that you would like to replicate in Bratislava at some point? I mean, of course, each friend and in different stage of development. That's very important. Uh, I'm, I'm glad that we're breaking silos, uh, silos with, with, uh, with the city hall to connect different departments and solve the problem the city is facing. Of course, I'm already mentioned and I'm very happy that we can cooperate with Bloomberg Philanthropies in Harvard. Uh, and we are working with them in various areas, for example, public space regeneration or digital services. I'm happy that now we are working with uh, UK government uh, consultancy FutureGo. And uh, of course, there is a city of Prague uh, where we streaming a lot of know-how from. So, yeah, many many cities doing fantastic job. So, we just um, washing around a little bit. Yeah. Well, thank you. Thank you very much for uh, spending a few minutes with us, uh, supporting this way the entrepreneurs that will be will be pitching their solutions uh, to the public. Thank you very much, and especially in these difficult times. And good luck with all your endeavors uh, and lots of energy. Good luck for everybody and I'm looking for the results of this, this evening. Thank you, thank you. This was Matusz Valo, the mayor of Bratislava. And now, and next on stage, is our opening keynote speaker, Mr. Martin Willig. Martin is the co-founder of Bolt, one of the fastest growing startups in the world, the fourth Estonian unicorn, and Martin is also the president of the Estonian Founders Society. Martin, welcome to the Challenger Demo Day. Hello, greetings from Tallinn. How are you doing? I'm doing great. Uh, very inspired to see uh, these entrepreneurs trying to pitch early on in their founder's life, and then I recall myself when we we're in somewhat similar position seven years ago. <laughs> exactly. So, so uh, Bolt is obviously now globally successful, but uh, Bolt actually started as M Taxo, and it entered into a accelerator run by Civita called Ayuyacht, which is, I think, Brain Hunt in in Estonia. And it was your brother Markus that participated in the in the program. And uh, you didn't win at the final demo day uh, as M Taxo, but you know apparently you, Bold is a clear winner now with the valuation that it has, with the global impact that it has. Uh, it has become a household name, and we're all using Bold as really on 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 daily basis. So Martin, would you have an advice uh, to tell? our startups, or not only our startups, but any startups either participating in an accelerator program or trying to, thinking about entering an accelerator program? Yeah, I, I think it really depends on the founder and what stage are you with your, with your business. So if you, if you have a very clear plan, you have a team, I think then you have a straight way to run and then just build your business. If you are still uh, hesitating or you don't have a clear product market fit you you need advising then of course uh, going to accelerator it gives you a bit of a push uh, a schedule 
and uh, and advisors to to really get somewhere and you you need to think things through for the demo day and it's good opportunity to for fundraise as well so yeah i i suggest that uh, it it depends what you want there are lots of opportunities and good showcases that accelerators have helped a lot of companies as well yeah, Martin, great. So uh, we're anxious to hear more about Bolt, about the story of Bolt. You can now share your presentation, if you can. And we'll be hearing about the story of Bolt from, a, from an idea project to really a global company with, with global impact. Okay. So I hope, I hope you see my presentation now. I don't think we see it. We don't see it yet. So we're waiting for the presentation to appear and we see it now. So Martin, the floor is yours. Okay. Yes, uh, I'm one of the three co-founders of Bolt. Um, we have uh, my younger brother, Marcus, who is currently the CEO and uh, technical co-founder, Oliver, and try to give a quick overview of how, how it is to build a uh, growth company out of Estonia from, from Eastern Europe. So um, I got the uh, idea of uh, Bolt in 2012 uh, when I was at the hackathon in, in Kiev and uh, I came back to Tallinn, I discussed it with Markus and, and we saw that, yeah, we, we should build a service like that also uh, in Estonia. As you know, then um, in Eastern Europe, the quality of taxis have always been very so, so, so there are some good companies and then some more shady drivers trying to cheat tourists and, and often the local customers as well. And Tallinn is a relatively small city, just a half a million people. And uh, during that time, we had 35 different taxi companies and only two of them were using any kind of software. So the rest were just using radio and, and the notebook to, and, uh, and the dispatch center. And, and only 10% of uh, taxi drivers were using any electronic payments. So majority of the business was all in cash. So, so that's where the situation where we started and we hope that, yeah, we can, we can make that industry uh, better. So if we take a step back, look at overall what's transportation in the cities, then we see that actually commuting and uh, traffic jams is, is very common in many of the cities. And, and uh, most average people in Europe commute uh, from 45 minutes to, to one hour. And uh, if, we, if we look at uh, Lagos, for example, in, in Africa, where we also operate, people can commute up to four hours a day. So sometimes our employees even stay at the office uh, for night because it, it might be more efficient than just going back home and, and, uh, and coming back to the office in the morning. So, so traffic jams and then the whole city uh, uh, city traffic is a problem in many of the cities globally. Uh, another thing we see is that many cities are, are designed around cars. And uh, if we look how many people have cars, then every second person in Estonia and in Europe have a car. And basically every American uh, in the US have cars. So, so it's a really lot of assets. But if you look at from the founders or entrepreneurs point of view, then it's not very well utilized uh, asset because most cars are standing 95% of the time. They are not really driving and, and making you money or providing value. And as they are uh, staying that much or parking, then we need very many parking spots in the cities. And uh, statistics shows that uh, in average city, there is usually eight parking spots uh, per, per car. So that can be a school, that can be your office, a sports club, stadium, cinema, whatever. So, so a lot of parking spots. And then in most popular places, in most common hours, the parking spaces are taken. And, and uh, a lot of time goes for drivers just to find the parking spot. So uh, we believe that uh, if we can redu reduce the number of private car ownerships and people use more on-demand services, then we need also less cars in the city and less parking spots, we can get uh, that space back to people, whatever we can build their parks or sporting facilities or whatever people like. Um, if we look at overall the industries, uh, we see that several industries already have had a big transformation uh, due to technology. So people are not looking normal TV anymore. Netflix is taking over. Very rarely people are looking for TV ads 
the same has happened to music and radio and all of that. Spotify has been a big uh, innovation there. If we look at books, uh, search engines, and, and even smartphones. So all of these trans, uh, industries have transformed. And uh, we see that similar things are very fastly happening on, also in transportation. So ride hailing have become very common and I'm very thankful everyone who's using Bolt. Uh, but uh, I see that uh, the transportation innovation is still very early stage and we don't know exactly what's, what's gonna happen. And, uh, and for other entrepreneurs, if you are not digitalizing and really thinking on that, then be sure that someone is coming to challenge and really take over your business as we have done for the traditional uh, taxi industry in, in many of the markets. So for example, in Tallinn, the biggest taxi company when we started had 400 cars and we have now one and a half million drivers and uh, they still have 350 cars. So, I mean, that's just one example how, how a big shift and technology and different thinking can, can uh, really influence an industry. But as I said, the main uh, challenge and competition for us is not other taxi companies, but it's actually private car ownership. And if we want to replace that, then we have to think that what are the use cases that why people use their private cars and how can we replace them with some more convenient or alternatives. So uh, overall, if we look at an average city in Europe, then it's roughly 50-50 between uh, commuting for public transport uh, private cars and usually only three to five percent is on demand or taxi service. But to replace the private cars, we, we then check the use cases. So some of it could be replaced with ride hailing. So when you need transportation, you can tap uh, in the mobile app and the car is coming with few minutes. Sometimes you need different kinds of cars or you need it for longer time. So that means that there should be very convenient car rental available close to your uh, spot. Uh, maybe some rides can be re replaced with public transportation if people uh, are more conscious on, on the green. And, and in some cities, if you have separate public transport lines, public transport can even go faster than the cars staying in the normal traffic lines in jams. Then we have micro mobility and in the end walking, which often people tend actually to even forget that, yeah, walking is also an opportunity to go by. People are so used to uh, to drive their cars. If we look at globally what's happening in the right hailing our main business, then it's pretty competitive. But uh, Bolt has been the last bigger platform that came into the market in 2013. All the other players were there before us. And now it's eight bigger players globally in different regions. And Uber initially started globally in all areas. And then they uh, saw that in some regions, the the competition was so fierce that they decided to uh, make joint ventures. And, and that happened at first in, in, in China with Didi, then secondly in, uh, with Yandex in Russia, uh, in Gra with Grab in Southeast Asia, and finally they bought Karim in the Middle East. So, um, and Didi, the Chinese player, have then expanded to Latin America, and uh, both of the public companies now, Lyft and Uber, are listed in stock exchange. They are competing head to head in, in US. And Bolt's uh, home market uh, is uh, Europe and Africa. That's the central green uh, box that you see there. And uh, we have actually managed to become the market leaders in Africa in the four and a half years that we have been operating there. We have been able to beat Uber there. Uh, the same has happened in Eastern Europe where we are winning many of the markets. But in Western Europe, Uber is still a uh, market leader and we really, really work need to work hard, especially in Paris and London, two of the main big cities that, um, that uh, we see that we, we have an opportunity to win over the next few years. Uh, so how Bolt is doing over the seven years, um, we have now over 200 cities uh, in more than 40 markets. Um, you can see the numbers are, are quite impressive for, for the growth and we are adding about two and a half million passengers every month now. Uh, but what's actually what we are quite proud of is Financial Times have, have listed all the European uh, fast growing companies and two years in a row we have been in top three uh, in that. So, so uh, I think it really shows that, uh, that we are growing fast in terms of European tech companies. 
if we look at funding in our industry, it's crazy. It's record funded among all the startups. So it's more than 70 billion uh, dollars or euros have invested there. Uh, but what we can see from here is that Bolt has raised the, uh, the smallest amount of funding, uh, but we have been the most efficient uh, player in our industry. And then we need to compete with Uber who has raised uh, about 80 to 100 times more funding um, uh, currently. So uh, we have three main business lines, uh, ride hailing, uh, which we have done seven years, uh, food delivery that we launched uh, one and a half years ago, and then uh, scooters, e-bikes, the micromobility, uh, which we have also been operating around two years. Uh, if we look at the overall opportunities, then uh, in ride hailing space, we operate with cars and motorcycles, and, and we are researching and developing the pooling system and uh, and also then the minibus uh, services are very popular in in africa we are thinking how to make them more efficient the second pillar the rentals uh, we operate electric scooters and e-bikes and then we are preparing for the car sharing um, or car rental uh, service and food delivery uh, during covid we very rapidly expanded that service from only four markets to now to 17 markets so it's much faster than we initially anticipated to grow and we also when COVID started in March within just one week we developed also the grocery service and package delivery service because uh, in many markets uh, rides were dropped significantly because of the lockdowns and I think Slovakia was uh, was the probably even the worst example where taxi services were banned at all so it was 100% of the taxi rides were dropped and we needed to find alternative ways for drivers. So that was food delivery, package delivery and groceries. And uh, finally, the fourth pillar is uh, mobility as a service. So that includes uh, uh, public transportation, both information and ticket sales, which uh, we are currently researching. Also exchanging data with cities so that they, they could plan their uh, public transportation and overall uh, the streets and then traffic routes better. And finally, multi-modality. Uh, what else is happening? So what is our vision actually for the future? For 10, 15 years, we believe that uh, people would not like to commute that much as they currently do. And if we, if we try to think why people are commuting that much, it's often that the city planning in the last 10, 20, 30 years have not been the most optimal. So people uh, work in other parts of the city. They often want to put their kids uh, to schools in city center or somewhere else. So that's a big portion of commuting and all the other things. So in our vision, a normal zone in a city where you could easily walk in 15, 20 minutes or, or bike or take a scooter, a lightweight transportation, you should have everything that you need in that space, starting from kindergarten to great schools uh, to sporting facilities, shopping, entertainment, and maybe even working and, and co-working facilities. Uh, so because we, COVID clearly shows us that majority of people don't need to go to the office every day. Social aspect is important, but you can do that a few days a week and the rest you can work from home or a co-working space uh, next to your home. So I think that that's how we see that we can reduce the number of forced commutes that people need to go to the office or school every day by 8 a.m. And then that creates a traffic jam. So we can split up that commuting all over the week and all over different times. And then that would, would then be much better for, for majority of our cities, make it more sustainable, greener, and, and better for all the citizens. And uh, we are working on a concept uh, or integration of all the different uh, transportation methods. So in five years, when you open up the Bolt app, you would put in a destination and uh, we will offer you three, four, five different combined alternatives. So you can walk, take a public transport and maybe last mile with a scooter. You can choose between electric car or uh, different other methods uh, that, that are available. So, so this is what we actually see as, as the future of multi, true multimodality. Um, as today's companies are also uh, working on sustainability, then uh, we have also taken that seriously. And for the last two, uh, one, and the, one and a half years, all the bolt rides in Europe are CO2 neutral. 
So uh, we measure our footprint of all the rides and we uh, buy the offsets. So we, we invest in certified uh, green projects. But we understand that that's not the solution, but just the first step what we can do. So we, are, we have a very clear roadmap uh, how to transform all our fleets to become electric, how to work with cities. So uh, we would uh, create better infrastructure for lightweight vehicles, electric scooters, bikes, uh, and integration, as I said earlier, with public transport, because currently we see that most people are not used to it because they don't know exactly how it fits to their plans. But if we put it all together with a multimodality, so from one app, you get a very small, smart route to your destination, which includes uh, scooters, walking, cars, uh, buses, and all of that, then I think that actually makes a transformation for uh, for more sustainable transport. And uh, as what, what is good in the multimodality is that uh, when you take a short ride in a city, let's say a few kilometers, and you want to order a taxi, and it's peak hour, we can actually recommend that, hey, by the way, there is electric scooter close by, and maybe you get the ride faster because you can pass the traffic jams, you can do it more environmentally, and uh, it's also cheaper. So, so that's how we see that having very, very different services next to each other in the same app, we can clearly make bigger impact for, for the cities. So uh, our team is now close to uh, 200, uh, or sorry, 2000 people, lots of nationalities and, and in, uh, in 40 uh, different offices. And uh, what's maybe important, uh, how we choose people, we often uh, prefer the attitudes over experience. So if we see that there are young people who are really eager to do something, change the world, and they believe in our mission, then we prefer them to, uh, let's say, lazy gurus with long experience, but they don't really want to uh, wanna work hard and, and really do great for, for the whole society. So. So I think that would be very shortly it from my side. Uh, I hope that we can now take uh, questions and, and, and discuss more on, on sustainability and, and how, how we see the wider impact of, of companies in, in our society. Thank you very much, uh, Martin, for this presentation. And I do have indeed a couple of questions, maybe some that you may not expect, but I believe that the audience is secretly asking them themselves. First one is very short one. Uh, you have showed the slide how Bold has captured Europe, mostly its eastern and central part, and Africa. Why would you say this is? Why did you succeed here? Or maybe why so heavily funded Uber did not? Um, we were really struggling to uh, fundraise in the first uh, three, four years, so from uh, 2014 to 2017. So four years we, uh, we needed to run and grow the company with just 1 million uh, euros of funding. Uh, on the same time, Uber had billions of funding. And uh, that kind of time really pressured us to think how we can bootstrap and be very, very efficient and, uh, and expand with, with very low budgets. And today, this has actually become our uh, competitive advantage because the whole company culture and DNA is, is so efficient and uh, we don't have highly paid uh, top executives and all of that. And everyone's really understanding that by being lean, that allows us to take lower commissions from the drivers, then drivers prefer us compared to other platforms that are taking 10 or 15 percent higher commission that brings more money to the drivers and the platform that has more drivers can offer better prices and that gets uh, more passengers and the end that cycle works very very well and we can be efficient with with lower commission we can be profitable in many of the cities but that's the dna and culture and and uh, that initially we don't, didn't understand it, but now we see that that's a longer term competitive advantage for any platform business. All right, so you took nothing for granted and yet you're still giving back. And uh, this is a question regarding the Founders Society. Peter uh, mentioned it before. Uh, my twist on the question is, why did you start Founders Society? Was it from something that you missed when you were a starter, starting up founder, and you filled this gap with the Founder Society? 
Yes, we, we started uh, the society 10 years ago in Estonia with just nine founders. So uh, today our ecosystem is very well developed, but that was a time that startup was a, a term that most of the people didn't know what it means. And, and uh, we went to one training program together and then we saw that it was really, really good to share experience, uh, discuss uh, about knowledge and then common, uh, common challenges. And that's how we started. And today we have 150 founders and, and uh, probably all the top founders in Estonia are, are belonging to that club. So overall, we have more than 1,000 startups in Estonia and then top 100 founders belong, belong to the club. But we are very open for, for giving back. So we have lots of uh, mentoring, lots of open initiatives and very active angel investor network. So many of the founders are doing early stage investments and then really meeting uh, young founders and then trying to to give back so so yeah I think that that's that's a very important part but it comes only together with the government as and, uh, it was good to see or see that that the major uh, mayor is is really also uh, being active on on startup events and all of that we have the same that we have been lucky Estonian prime ministers and the presidents have been supporting the ecosystem and and being our salesmen globally, but also understanding what are the legal challenges, which laws we need to improve and, and all of that. So stock options or uh, selling company shares or any other things uh, where we have, uh, we lack competitive advantage. Estonia is now on top of this charge and thanks to our government for really making the legal environment very good in Estonia. All right, so this was a shout out to Estonian government. Uh, maybe some of our governments are hearing on the other side of the screen. And uh, let me maybe wrap up with the final question. You have mentioned you have 650 people working in Estonia, but they're from many different nations. So you bring talent to Estonia, but what do you do to keep the talent that is already in Estonia to stay and to further develop? So, um yeah, we, um, we want to make sure that we, we have a very vibrant and, and open uh, society and people would actually understand uh, that uh, bringing in foreign specialists is, is important and we don't have all the people we need in Estonia and, and, uh, and we need also really top specialists from global companies to, to come to Estonia, work in our companies and share the experience with locals. But, uh, but on the other hand, then we also try to give back and, and uh, improve the education system so that uh, we would be able to grow good local talent as well. And recently we started a coding school in, in Eastern part of Estonia, which we hope that we can start training 200 um, uh, new generation uh, software developers there. And, and it's a big cooperation project between also the public sector and the private sector where we invest several million euros to kick off the, the school and, and really give back to that, that part of Estonia, but also wider to the, to the whole community. So, so yeah, we are active in, in, in uh, different spaces from education to green to really uh, city planning. So, so we, we try to think how to improve our impact as, as a good, responsible company. Thank you very much, Martin, for uh, these insightful answers. And before I let you go, did you also star in Chasing Unicorns? Yes. Uh, OK, <laughs> not exactly in the movie, but, uh, but we, as Estonians try to do, uh, we created a, a video school out of that movie. If you, if you have seen it, check the movie. But it's also a school uh, with the best entrepreneurs in Estonia commenting all the phases of startups, so how to how to find an idea, how to compile a team, how to fundraise, how to build a product. So this is all freely available in, in YouTube and, uh, and the Unicorn uh, Movie website. So check it out and, and uh, use it also in your schools if you, if you want to, to inspire young entrepreneurs. Thank you very much, Martin. Everybody check out the movie Chasing Unifor Uniforms, Unicorns, of course. And thank you for your time. Thank you for your presentation and we hope you're going to stay with us for the live stream to see the pitches of the seven startups coming up. Yeah, good luck, good luck with all the founders on the pitch. Bye-bye. <laughs>
pitching basically boils down to a short, concise, and convincing business presentation by a startup, most likely to an investor, but also to a potential partner or client. And tonight, we will see seven such pitches. Uh, as you may have noticed, eight were officially and originally planned. And the reason for this change is actually a very positive one, because the last startup, Makers, has signed a strategic business partner in a contract. They're going to extend their cooperation and invest significantly in their future development. And therefore, under the um, exclusivity agreement, Makers cannot pitch publicly tonight. As for those who will pitch tonight, they will have three minutes, and three minutes only after that time, a sound will be heard, and they will not be allowed to continue. Afterwards, our jury will be given three minutes to ask questions. Startups have also prepared pitch decks where they visualize the problem and the solution as well as their business model, relevant market and competition, future development plans, and their teams. A jury will be judging them based on the criteria of investability, scalability, innovativeness, team, pitch quality, and the progress they have made over the last four months. Together, these criteria and the jury will decide who will be the winner of the main prize, which is, as you may recall, an investment opportunity of 250,000 euros from CB Investment Management. And you should be really hearing these pitches carefully, because in the end, you will be asked to cast a vote using Slido, so that one of these guys, one of these startups, can win the audience prize, yours, your prize, which is going to be a service package provided by Civita, Majernika, Mihalikova, and The Spot. Next up, let's meet our jury. So, I would like to welcome our jury here in the studio with us, albeit only virtually. They are hailing from four different corners of Europe. First, it is welcome to Miriana Krolo, the Chief Operations Officer at IPTQ by Swiss Re, which develops and creates scalable digital insurance solutions. Hi, Miriana. Hello. Hi, you were there for the progress pitch, which took place some two months ago. Based on that experience, what are you hoping to see tonight? Focus and innovation. Short and concise, just like a yes. lovely pitch it should be. Thank you, Miriana. Uh, next up is Eamon Carey. Uh, Eamon is uh, the managing director at the Techstars London Accelerator and a partner at The Fund. Uh, he was previously MD at Techstars Connection in New York and has invested in over 60 companies from the US, Europe, Africa, and Asia. Hi, Iman. Hey, thanks for having me. It's great to see everyone. Lovely to hear you. Um, what do you think, in your opinion, is the most important ingredient to impress VCs outside of the CEE region, say, those from London? I think it's great to see some initial traction, you know, some initial uh, user love if you're building a B2C company. So starting to see how people are using the product, starting to see some maybe feedback from B2B clients so that we can get a picture of, you know, the company accelerating and moving forwards and, and see a direction of travel for them expanding into markets like London or into the uh, US or, or other markets. So really momentum is the key thing that all of these companies and many others have to generate. All right, thank you very much, Eamon. And for the audience, here is a great uh, investment advice. So if you want to vote for your favorite based on the jury's criteria, this was just one of them. And be on the lookout for this in the startup speeches. Thank you, Eamon. Next up, we have um, Michal Neshpor from CB Investment Management, our main uh, investment partner of this program. And he's also a partner at Crowdberry Crowd Investing Platform. Hi, Michal. Do you hear me, Michal? Judging by your face, I would guess you don't hear me. 
Well, we will solve this technical issue, and uh, I will jump to Rivo Anton, who is hailing from Estonia, uh, where he's behind some major startup and innovation initiatives. He's a founding partner at the United Angels VC and Civita, one of the early bold investors and the star of the movie Chasing Unicorns. Hi, Rivo. Hello. Good to hear you. It was good to hear you, too. Um, I have a quick one for you. Riddle me this. How is it possible that it is Estonia which has the highest number of unicorns per capita? And for those who do not know, a unicorn is a company valued at over one billion dollars. Well, I think it must be the weather. Uh, you know, Estonia is very cold, it's dark, it's raining very often, and people do not have much other to do than work. So I think that's one of the reasons. Well, when climate change kicks and you're going to have some tropical weather, then we can expect somebody else to pick up the slack. Now, I will just ask Michal if he hear me. I do hear you. Do you hear me now? Yes, we can hear you. Lovely that we have solved this out. Now, um, I have a question for you, too. I was in my stalker mode the other day, and I saw just in how many member of the board positions you are listed on your LinkedIn profile. Um, how many companies did you and your funds invest in? And what advice do you have for the startups pitching here tonight or anybody else if they want to mm. join your club? Mm. Well, out of the latest fund, we've invested in 16 companies and all together uh, with the platform investment, it's uh, 32, I think. And I'm sitting on roughly one third of them. Um, and the advice would be try to be as concise as possible. Um, bring over the message um, that you want to bring to the jury so that we can compare um, your pitch to uh, the other ones quite easily. Thank you, Michal. This is a great advice to the startups listening to this. When you get a question, get to the point as fast as possible because you do not have as much time as you think. Now, so this is our jury, Miriana, Iman, Michal, and Rivo. And uh, I will try to moderate uh, the best I can the Q&As. Uh, the jury members will raise their hand to show the interest in asking a question. And to remind you, uh, the jury will be the ones deciding who will get the main invest, well, the main prize, which is an investment opportunity of 250,000 euros by exactly CB Investment Management. And you will be then the ones voting for the People's Choice Award, which is a service package. Now, tonight's pitching pioneer is Christian Credatus and uh, his company, Edris Livestock Insider. Christian and his team are developing a solution to optimize feed and yields of farm animals. For us, Challenger Accelerator was a great deep dive into different business topics. In doing so, it allowed us to challenge our own ideas, business and concepts. Our gas detector drastically reduces the cost of farms. With the investment, it would allow us to affect the lives of hundreds of farms just this year and thousands going forward. So this was the short introductory video of Christian and Ediris. Uh, Christian is currently in Paris. I hope he will hear us well and we will hear him well as well. If you're ready, you can start your three minute pitch now. Thank you, Christina. Yes, uh, hello everybody. My name is Christian. I'm a co-founder at Ediris. We use technology to optimize nutrition for farm animals. So we happen to be a business and we happen to be a family business. Uh, my father has experience of over 30 years in the field of animal nutrition. My brother has expertise in machine learning field and I have business background. I previously worked in management consulting and investment banking. So what's the problem here? Farmers that currently produce milk do not know if their production is efficient. They do not know if the feed that they give to the animals is okay. This leads them to waste 15% of costs that they dedicate to the feed 
every year. This is where we step in. We leverage very simple yet very powerful relationship between gases that the animals produce, nutrition that they are given, and milk production. We put a very simple sensor inside a sheltered stable. This sensor collects and interprets the information contained in gases and informs farmer or nutritionist on real-time health condition of the animals. It then uses our proprietary machine learning mechanism to come up with a recipe for nutrition improvement, which is tailor-made. We already conducted a pilot project. This time it was on a farm in Slovakia. We managed to increase the milk production by 25%. Then we reduced CO2 emissions by 11%. Let me speak just that the production was already above average at this farm. We use very simple plug and play concept. We only send our device to the farmer who pulls it out of the box and is immediately able to start using it. We charge our clients on monthly fee basis for each shed. This translates into total addressable market of 2 billion euros annually. As you can see, the market has been growing quite substantially. There is a huge ecological aspect to our business since cows and other farm animals contribute to global emissions almost as much as global traffic. It also means that if we manage to scale up our business globally, we would maybe be able to reduce global emissions by 5%. We plan to break even by 2025. This is assuming that we reach revenue of 7 million euros. In our case, it means reaching to clients in uh, 3,000 of clients which means 9,000 devices, uh, roughly. In terms of competitors, we are the only one and the first one to come up with a tailor-made recipe using machine learning, using gases as main input. We are currently launching a second very important pilot project, this time with a multi-billion corporation that is oriented on this field and they were interested in our idea and so we launched the cooperation. To wrap it up, we're looking for an investment I'm sorry, Christian, but you almost made it. We saw the information that you wanted to say on the screen. So you can say congrats to yourself. You managed to be the first one to pitch successfully. Now I would like to give space for our jury. Who has the first question? By show of hands. Well, then I will choose Michal if he has a question to ask. Yeah, I think there is something wrong with the IT. I keep raising my hand and uh, you don't see the, you don't see it, guys. But very quickly, um, good presentation. Um, I would be interested to learn what your sales strategy is going to be. How, how are you planning to reach your customers? So we can basically reach our customers two ways. First of all, we can reach directly are directly farmers using a team of salespeople, or we can go through different, different members of a supply chain, like going through the consulting companies that are actually present on farms, consulting companies like my father happens to work for. So there are different uh, ways. We still wait to, to launch the product on a larger scale. And so this will be, of course, iterative process. Uh, next up, do we have an interested uh, speaker? Maybe just start talking because my high-tech solution of you raising hands seems to have some bugs. So uh, just start asking if you have a question. Oh, Eamon, Eamon, I see you. Uh, I think there's a little bit of a delay. I was actually going to ask the question that Mikhail asked uh, about acquiring customers, but would love to understand kind of, um, you know, you talked a little bit about this pilot that you're entering into with a, with a large um, conglomerate kind of what will that involve what sort of distribution do you think you'll be able to achieve with that so uh, for us it was important to see that the huge player that literally has a multi-billion uh, presence in all corners of the world is interested in the idea we literally spoke to people who elevated it up to the board they said it's very interesting so for us it's a huge example of first of all of a of attraction that the product might have. And second of all, they provided us with resources uh, like feed for the animals, et cetera, et cetera. Going forward for us, the largest potential is of course the knowledge that they could have. Of course, they have a huge access to almost you know, every second farm that, that there is in Europe. So this is for us, um, strategically speaking, a super important thing. 
Thank you very much, Iman, for the question. I believe Miriana was also uh, raising yeah. hand. Um, just a short one. Uh, what was the what were the key lesson learned for you comparing to the previous speech? Um, wow, that's a very good question. For <laughs> me, um, every pitch is very different. You might you might think that we always get to ask you know the same questions. For me, it was better better to be better prepared for every question to think more about the concept to think more about the ideas this that's also where challenger accelerator helps us a lot thank you very much the jury thank you christian the three minutes for the questions are up we apologize for any uh, technical issues and we're working on them uh, so this was uh, ediris our first startup our second startup tonight is going to be HVolt, and co-founder Ivan Lindowski is going to present their e-mobility infrastructure solution. Hi everyone, my name is Ivan and I'm a co-founder of HVolt, a Slovak innovative startup based in Bratislava that is on a mission to accelerate mass e-mobility adoption through our unique EV charging digital ecosystem. Challenger Accelerator was an incredible ride for HVolt. We got many valuable feedback from local and international mentors, coaches and investors. Thanks to them, we could understand what our moonshot really is and what the EV user needs really are. I believe that HVolt is the most relevant startup to win this competition. Our vision is not only about e-mobility adoption, but also about energy optimization and thereby helping towards achievement of UN Sustainable Development Goals. This is a fantastic opportunity for an investor to get involved in a sector where the demand for EV charging infrastructure is exponential. Thank you, Ivan, for recording this lovely video. And I hope you are well connected, your microphone is on, and you are ready to deliver your pitch right now. Thank you, Christina. Hello everyone, my name is Ivan and I'm a co-founder of HVolt, a Slovak innovative startup that is on a mission to accelerate the e-mobility adoption and liberate EV users by providing no-cost charging. There are two main problems e-mobility adoption faces. 44% of EV users worry about the lack of charging infrastructure and increased EV charging is forecasted to result in 10% electricity demand surge for the grid. So our, our solution is about developing a comprehensive digital ecosystem that enables EV charger owners to share their charges with the public, that optimizes energy usage with the dynamic load balancing and facilitates energy exchange. We are making EV charging convenient and accessible whilst achieving dynamic energy distribution. According to the EU Federation for Transport and Environment, there is five time potential growth in the EV chargers, platform users, and exchange energy value in Europe by 2023. For this reason, we have developed three products. We produce smart EV chargers that combines with the proprietary energy management system and a digital platform that is powered by blockchain and then that enables EV charger sharing and energy exchange. We will sell this product through two main revenue channels. HO distribution, which is about making revenue from sale of chargers, energy management system, and other accessories, and HVO Digital, which is about earning revenue from a transaction fee from EV charging, energy exchange, and other marketing activities. We have already paying customers, among which are real estate, retail, charger manufacturers, and distributors, and others. There are already different hardware producers, charge for networks, and cloud platforms on the market, but we are about to offer all of these on an integrated digital ecosystem for collaboration and more. We are forecasting the positive EBITDA of 4 million euros in 2023 with an income of 40 million euros and a margin of 6.7 million euros. We have pretty successful year 2020. We uh, achieved a revenue of 100,000 euros with the customers such as NG, ABB, and Kobe and Nota we were able to form strategic partnerships with the TECO, OMS, and DXC technology. 
And we were awarded the Seal of Excellence certificate and won a second place and 15,000 euros prize at the Climate Day Slovakia. All this wouldn't be possible without the capable and experienced team and advisory board experts. At the moment, we are looking for investment up to 2 million with a future company value of 40 million euros and eight times ROI for an investor. We will use this money to develop digital platform and open new market in the next few years. Thank you very much for your attention. Please join us and together we can revolutionize the e-mobility. Thank you, Ivan, for the speech you made. It's on time. Great job. And uh, now we can get to the jury question. And just a side note, while we're fixing technical issues, I will switch from democracy to autocracy, and I will uh, choose a juror to ask a question. Uh, going straight at it, Rivo, you, as one of the early investors in e-mobility, such as Bolt, do you have a question for Ivan? Yes, thank you. So you mentioned that you had a uh, 100k revenue already last year. I'm wondering about the sources of this revenue, how much of it was through the platform and how much of it was by selling the charging stations? Yeah, uh, at the moment it was only from uh, selling the hardware, so the, the charging stations. The digital platform, uh, we, are, we are still like developing and it will be finished in the next uh, yeah, half year. So it was most mainly from the, the hardware sale. Thank you. Much, uh, Eamon, may I give the word to you? For sure, uh, great pitch. Um, maybe tell me a little bit about the competitive landscape. Who else are you up against when you're going out and talking to clients and you know what are the advantages of your platform versus theirs? Yeah, so we always say it's like, uh, like how could Bolt succeeded on the market when there were already, you know, like uh, uh, taxi companies uh, that were working for a hundred years. So we always, uh, we are trying to approach a new market with an innovative solution and we, that we adapted to the current needs. So we always try to explain to the customer that we are not the, the, the old e-mobility company, but we came with a new uh, approach. Does this satisfy your question, Eamon? Or Yeah, be, I'd be curious, What do you say there's something specific about the approach that you're taking or is, is there something that really makes your clients yeah, so, or your partner's eyes light up? Yeah, so, so what's specific is that we are going to develop a one-stop platform for all EV users' needs. So they could then pay, charge, share their chargers and do the load balancing and energy exchange through our application. So this is like what we are kind of Telling to the customers and what's like our unique value proposition. Uh, may I ask Miriana if she has a question as she's coming from this digital scalable solutions uh, environment? Yeah, my question is you said it will be eight times ROI, yeah, but when do you plan to achieve break even point? Uh, in two years' time. Okay, thanks. And to finish the round, uh, Michal? Yes, um, for you to scale to other markets, you will uh, need uh, mass adoption of, uh, of the charging stations. So my question is, what is your sales strategy? How do you plan to sell the hardware to as many households and users as possible? So we are going to use the national partners for the small and medium companies, the multinational partners for the large companies, the international ones. We will also approach the, the, the customers directly, but the, the mostly like the large customers like real estate developers, for example. And uh, with the digital platform, we'll use online marketing or we'll connect maybe to other ecosystems. Thank you very much, Ivan, and thank you, Jury, for this energetic Q&A. Uh, everybody got to ask a question, which is perfect, and thank you, Ivan, for your pitch. We continue with much. Robert Cepka, uh, representing company eVision Systems. eVision develops a way devices to regenerate, regenerate the lost capacity of lead-acid batteries. The amount of uh, information and knowledge I receive from Challenger is huge. Challenger is an excellent program that helped me to grow personally and to mature our project significantly. 
We are in the interesting market with huge growth potential. We have MVP, which has been validated by first customers. Our business model is new and unique in our field. I am not saying that everything is obvious and sure for 100% yet, but we have vision and we have will and I believe also abilities to realize it. So you have just seen introductory video of eVision systems and Robert Cepka should be on the other side of the line ready to deliver his pitch right now. Yes, I'm here. Thank you very much. Hi, my name is Robert. We are the battery advanced services company. Batteries are sensitive to operating conditions. If not kept within required limits, they tend to fail and need to be replaced prematurely. Evision is addressing these challenges by two solutions, battery capacity restoration and battery analysis. The first part of our solution is a non-invasive battery capacity restoration. Our hardware devices restore the capacity by applying electrical shocks into the battery. The second part of our solution is the battery IOET platform. It stores detailed data about batteries and produces outputs like reports, analysis, predictions. We process data from two main sources, our own devices and external sources like renewables, telecom, industry, or even EVs. Our solution saves up to 85% on annual ownership costs comparing to new battery. It also reduces carbon footprint substantially. Uh, through the hardware and service business model, we want to rent our devices to customers and provide them an account in our battery IoT platform. The analytic services will be available on per battery and per operation basis. Our end users are practically all battery owners. The majority of our sales will go through local partners. Our devices are a complete battery maintenance tools and together with our battery IoT platform are superior to, to competitors. Due to fact that capacity recovery de devices are investment very intensive, our business model will make them much more affordable and available to all customers. In the first stage, we will focus on lead-based batteries. In contrary to what you may think, this market is huge and is still growing. Processing just 5% of all batteries that fail prematurely would bring us about 20 million of euros incomes yearly on rental fees. We have already uh, completed commercial projects and implemented several pilot projects. Other market validation activities are in our pipeline. We will be ready for uh, full lead-based battery capacity restoration at the end of this year. Our analytic services, followed by lithium battery capacity restoration, are planned to launch in the following two years. All right. Thank you, Robert. Sadly, the time is up, but you were almost done. So thank you for the lovely pitch. I didn't make it. Yeah, <laughs> it's OK. You, you almost <laughs> done it. But now yeah. the jury can ask questions, and they can ask maybe what you were planning to say on those last slides. Now to the jury, I continue in the tradition of autocracy, and I will give the word to Miriana. Yeah, uh, question. What is your sales strategy? All of our sales are planned uh, to be made through external partners. So we want to uh, uh, make a network of local partners and sell all our devices or uh, our services through them. Is this a satisfactory answer to you, Miriana? Yeah. Perfect. Uh, I will ask Rivo to ask. Yes. Um, I was actually surprised that you are focusing on lead acid batteries as, as the first uh, priority. So I'm wondering, um, 
is there a sweet spot like how big or what's the capacity of the battery uh, that need you know the battery should have in order to qualify as a customer or as 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 your target is it like small batteries such as maybe a private cars would have or maybe even like larger batteries that you know some of the larger trucks or, or trains might have mm -hmm. yeah uh... In principle, we are able to process all lead acid batteries because the technical principle is the same. However, uh, from the from the business perspective or return on investment perspective, it is worth to to recover only larger batteries uh, with purchasing price uh, 40 euros and up let's say and of course the most imp uh, expensive batteries like forklift batteries or or uh, solar batteries uh, are the best business and and the, the benefit is the biggest of course Rivo, would you like to add something thank you thank you as well uh, i will continue and give words to michal yes um I was wondering, you mentioned some financial savings uh, for the customer. Uh, does this already include any logistical issues um, or, and or um, implementing your solution into their life cycle? Uh, no, uh, that 85% of uh, savings are meant for uh, in-house uh, capacity restoration uh, done by customer itself. Uh, our devices, we have also uh, uh, mobile devices, which can be carried out to the remote, pl remote place. Uh, then the expenses would be a bit higher. So the savings wouldn't be that high, but uh, still uh, significant, of course. And it is also possible to, to, possible to do capacity restoration as a serv service by third party. Then the uh, expenses are higher a little bit and savings are, are, are getting over, of course, a bit. But still very interesting also this business, from this business model point of view. Thank you very okay, much, Robert, you. for this question. Uh, this concludes the Q&A uh, connected to the eVision systems pitch. Uh, with the next pitch, we will continue uh, in the energy field, and Martin Schichmann from Arche will detail their approach to hydro plants in the city. We learned the difference between running a company and playing a running one. We have found first clients and established an international consortium. We have won 20k and applied for the annual innovation lab. I need to quit my job. The second we get invested, I want to get all in. Na Slovensku niektoré firmy vyvíjajú moderné technológie, ktoré môžu preraziť vo svete. Here. Here. There. Here. And at 4500 other places around the globe, people can finally start using the full potential of river power. So welcome back. Martin Schichmann from Arche, I believe you are ready and you are hyped to deliver the fourth pitch of tonight and you can start now. Our civilization was fueled by fire for millennia. Today we know only renewables are the future. But they are not stable, which is a problem. Wind works only 30% of the time and solar less than 20. Hydro energy is different because it provides stable electricity for 24 hours a day. Nevertheless, Hydra also has a problem. You can't build a dam everywhere. They are expensive and damage ecosystems. I knew there must be another way. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, a way to make Hydra modular, flexible, and scalable. My name is Martin, and I present to you my invention, Spear. Our technology uses waving motion of fins to generate electricity. Unlike classical turbines, fins are moving slowly, pose no risk to ecosystems, and can withstand debris. We are the first Slovak company to win the cat 4 cp European grant to fund research at the Hans Schickard Institute in Germany, where we certified our power output at 190 kilowatts. Our technology is protected since 2017. The US patent was granted in 2020 and EU will follow in 2021. 
One spear generates costs 770,000 and generates 130,000 euros in electricity per year. To support renewables, current legislations grant the grid access, the buyer, and the fixed electricity price of 109 euros per megawatt hour for next 15 years. For now, state is our client, but we are already developing links to Riverside industry, Riverside developers, and cities. DEC can make additional 140,000 euros in rent annually, be the restaurant or educational center. As the letter of intent from River Park 2 developer suggests, Spear has a big marketing value as well. We estimate Spear Hydro can be deployed in 4,500 places worldwide, both on and off grid. We are fundraising 400K to submit a new patent, hire the fundraising team for grants, build a large prototype to verify our technology at the partner's barge on Danube. Our disruptive technology is a perfect candidate for public funding, and therefore we have decided to build a consortium and focus on grants that will help us develop the technology to a market-ready pilot. Based on this pilot, we will start both serial and custom production. Later, we want to license our technology. Our team is always growing. I'm the inventor, and I have designed the ship before. Marek is our operations manager, and Michael develops business and advises Slovak regulatory office. Recently, Adrian Vichital and his IPM team joined the advisory board to help us with financing and partnerships. We have won research grants and competitions. We have patented and certified our technology, but the real notch came with Challenger. We have built a small prototype, secured heavyweight partners for R&D and grant application, found clients, and I am finally ready to quit my job of the moment we secure the funding. Thank you, and thank you, Challenger. Thank you very much, Martin, for this beautifully timed presentation. And now we can give word to the jury. And I would like to ask Eamon to be the one to open the Q&A. Uh, thanks very much. Very uh, impressive uh, presentation there. Um, what's needed to go to the larger prototype? How much do you think uh, you're going to need in terms of a capital investment to get it to something that you will be able to, to fully prove out uh, the model? We want to build a scale one to two, maybe like a half-sized prototype, which would cost around 200,000 euros. But if we don't get the funding, we are ready to make one to three, which will be very ugly, but we can make it really cheap. Right, uh, next time. quote by Reid Hoffman. If you're not embarrassed by the first version of your product, you've launched it too late. Yeah, I heard that. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Eamon. Miriana, do you have something to add? Uh, yes. Uh, what is the, based on, on, on your previous answer, what is the compromise you are willing to accept? Design versus quality, basically first versus third version of the product. Yes, you've seen we like design very much, but in this case, the prototype really has to be functional, uh, safe and, and uh, research ready thing where we can adjust things. So, so we won't be really trying to make something nice. But in and how much time do you need? Mm -hmm. How in much six time months do you need can, for prototype? Uh, six months. We already built a ship, so we have all the infrastructure needed, and we already have a place to put it. Thank you. Thank you very much. Michal Nespor, do you have additional questions? Sure. Um, except for investment slash funding, what are the biggest challenges to make this happen, in your opinion? Uh, our network is growing and uh, we had some discussions both with industry and uh, real estate developers and uh, challenges are there, how to address more of them and uh, how the talks will go. So far, it has been great and we are excited about it, but I see that that is, that is something we have to work on. Do you have a follow up, Michal? Yeah, I was, uh, was trying to understand, I mean, network is obviously one thing. But are there any challenges yes. in terms of connecting it to the grid, um, in terms of getting some permits, um, CE marks, some regulation, safety, et cetera, et cetera? Uh, exactly what you named, the regulation, uh, we are already uh, looking into it. 
uh, deeper. For, for now, we are using established waterways and the legislation about the depth of the river and, and so on. So we are using what we know, but we need to hire lawyers to go deeper in it. Uh, regarding connection to the grid, we are going to use uh, standardized uh, uh, transformers or, or the adapters that are already used by our renewable resources like solar plants or, or wind farms. So we don't have to deal with uh, electricity that much because that's not our focus. But those are available, so we just install them into our after our generator and they will generate the sign that is needed and the voltage and everything else. Thank you very much. This wraps up uh, questions and answers for Arche and for Marjorie. Thank you, Martin. And uh, you stay tuned for our next presentation where Lubomir Ilečko, founder of Aerobot, will pitch a self-maintenance system for industrial robots. Thanks to Challenger Accelerator, I have met many interesting people from different fields. I have acquired useful knowledge on how to accelerate the business properly and make an innovative tool that became a final product, attract wider attention and break into the market. <coughs> we offer innovative and ecological solution that we will ensure self-maintenance of industrial robots. Our idea is not just a tool, it's a physical product. Thanks to the investment which we need to complete the development and start production, we can accelerate the rapid return of investment and generate profit. Thank you very much for the opportunity to present our company. Thank you Lubomir for this lovely introductory video and I hope you are connected and tuned into your pitch which starts now. Thank you, Christina. Isaac Asimov, third robotics law was, robots have to protect themselves. I'm Lubomir, the CEO of eRobot, and we teach them to do just that. By 2025, there will be more than 5 million industrial robots. They cost money to maintain and are not green. Every day I hear that robots will be used for maintenance across all industries. So why can't robots be maintained by other robots? They can. And the key factor is proper lubrication. In 2012, I moved into robotics from automotive industry, working as quality manager in gearbox production for leading robot manufacturers, such as KUKA and ABB. I analyzed a range of robot failures and discovered a correlation between proper lubrication and robot sustainability. The solution is an automatic cell maintenance control system. This solution comes in two parts, software and hardware. The software is artificial intelligence, which analyzes all major lubrication parameters. The hardware uses that analysis to initiate our cell healing system. This is the best prevention against oil leakage and robot breakdown. Our value proposition is clear. We save money, increase productivity, and go green. As you can see, the market is huge. 2.8 million industrial robots in the world's factories and 0.4 million annual installations of new robots. Our goal is to achieve more than 5% share of robotic market by 2025. We have planned for B2B sales model based on rental and licensing revenues from system integration inside the robot construction by robot manufacturers. Where revenues will be more than 84 million. Our competitors monitor only robot failures by vibro diagnostic or motion control, but they cannot prevent robot damage. We offer solution which directly identifies root cause of this robot failure and prevents robot breakdown in early stage. This is our team. We have the experience, knowledge, and expertise to deliver. We have already raised two rounds and we are looking at 1.6 million euro in the third round of financing for the product development, testing, and scaling up. Thank you for attention. Thank you, Lubomir, for this timely 
page and also for the Isaac Asimo shout out. Now I would like to give the word to the jury, starting with Rivo. Sure, thank you. Uh, I'm wondering about your go-to-market strategy. You told that you are probably using distributors for, for reaching your uh, customers, but I'm wondering if there are some specific segments like automotive or, or some other uh, you know, vertical that would be especially suitable for you as a, as a good uh, uh, first go-to-market uh, point. We decided to go for this market for robotics and we are focused mostly on robot manufacturers because uh, we working on the solution which should be installed and integrated inside the robot during the production in assembly line in robot manufacturers. Of course, we are still too big to, for example, use our solution in the cars and other, maybe in the future. But in the moment, we are mainly focused on the robotics because I think that it can be future. Yeah, maybe maybe just to follow on on, on the same. Uh, I was more wondering about whether you know some specific robots are more suitable for your uh, for your solution than others the solution will be possible use in any 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 type of the robot because each robot has the same construction what is different is only rubrication which they are using got it thank you thank you Riva. miriana do you have a question to add uh, yes how did you came up with the name e-robot what was the inspiration for your idea mm. E robot because we would like to reduce waste which are created by, during the robot maintenance. And E is like eco, environmental friendly, that we would like to bring new concept of the robotics which will be not creating waste. This is the e robot vision. Thank you very much. Iman, may I ask you for a question? It's, uh, thank you for the Asimov quote as well. Uh, always good to hear it. Um, I'm just curious, have you got any pilots or partnerships or how are the relationships with some of the robot manufacturers? You know, have you started conversations around any testing or uh, deployment with any of the, the big ones? Yeah, thank you. It's a good question. Um, technical feasibility we validate in, in Volkswagen Skoda Auto is a car producer. But we also uh, built a prototype pilot for leading robot manufacturer which using robots in medical sector. And he has a problem with overheating. And because our solution is able also regulate temperature pressure inside the robot. So we passed, last year we finished the, the test and now we are continuing in, in, in developing because it is not only harder, we need to tune the software, of course. Thank you very much. This ra wraps up uh, the Q&A session for Aerobot. Uh, everybody loved the Isaac Asimov quote, so you should definitely keep it in your pitch. The next pitch uh, will take us all around the globe. Uh, Jakub Lyman and his startup Grandcom build a worldwide network of shared ground stations for satellite operations. Thanks to Challenger Workshop and Mentors, we have significantly rebuilt our business plan, we have added subscription model to our service, and we have secured our first two customers. During the acceleration program, we have validated our solution, demonstrated necessary skill set on board, so with an investment, we are ready to speed up customer acquisition and make space more accessible. So this was short intro into Jakub Lyman's Groundcom. And now let's hear him from the man himself, Jakub and Groundcom. Start pitching now. Good evening. My name is Jakub Lyman and I'm co-founder of Groundcom. This is CubeSat, small powerful satellite helping us monitor weather, climate, dangerous, or provide satellite images. Satellites generate petabytes of data. It's a huge amount of data. To download this data and control the satellite, use antennas like this. It's called ground station. Let's say university is about to launch a satellite into orbit for an experiment. They have bought an expensive ground station and place it, for example, in Bratislava. But you know, Earth is not flat and it's spinning, so they can download data for only about one hour a day when a satellite flies about Europe. It means very little data to be downloaded 
and for 23 hours, they are just waiting to another flyby. They wish they could have an antenna around the world like this. That would be an incredible investment. So this is Groundcom, network of ground stations around the world accessible online. So how does it work? The university doesn't buy the ground station, they just log in into our cloud platform and they can use any of our antennas whenever they want to communicate with their satellite. Paid as a subscription for a predefined time or per minute for ad hoc connection. And if they already have an antenna, they can use our platform, sell it its idle time when they are not using it to other operators, scalable like an Airbnb. In addition to more time for downloading data, using our platform, they can save more than 50% on connectivity expenses. Small satellite market is booming. As satellites become more affordable, universities and commercial companies plan to launch more than 7,000 new small satellites into orbit in the next eight years, comparing to 1,500 currently out there. So this is the right time for us. In the past six months, we have received 50,000 grants from European Space Agency. We are now building our two first ground station, which can generate half a million per year in revenue with just 30 customers. And we have secured two pilot customers to use our service this year. All this cannot be done without such a great team. The founding team combined direct experience from European Space Agency in the field of antenna design, software development for space missions, international sales of high-tech products, and launching another uh, aerospace startup in 2018, uh, which is now under negotiation to be acquired. We also work closely with our strong partners from corporate, academic, and research sector. To boost our progress, we look for investment half million euro to build four more ground stations around the world, boost our marketing and sales to acquire 20 new customers, continue with our R&D to make our technology also work for lunar and Mars missions. Join us. This is Groundcom and our first step to communicate the future colonies on Mars. Thank you for this definitely concise presentation for your pitch. And I would like to open the Q&A first with Michal Nespor asking. Okay. I like that you said that Earth is not flat. That really humored me. Uh, I have a question with regards your uh, IP uh, technology product. Uh, what of uh, all what you are going to or planning to offer to your customers is your own development and what is third party? Yeah, so uh, one of the big part is uh, cloud and energy software, which is actually not patentable like an Airbnb. Right now, we are using the commercial components to build the ground station, but we are working and we have already designed our own custom rotator. And we are also working on the artificial intelligence based satellite communication model, which uh, would be very unique in the future. Thank you very much. I believe that uh, now the feature of raising hands can be reinstated, uh, but I will give words to Mirjana then. Mirjana, start. Yeah, um, question. What do you see as your top two risks? And how do you plan to mitigate them? Uh, our biggest risk is actually to be, I think, flexible enough in, in this market, because I think right now we have a very so solid plan, which actually we just, we just need to speed up. But uh, actually, it's about to like, see like, how the market is maybe changing or what the new players they are. So uh, we, are, we are actually attending all the conferences to be like, really on the top of the, all the knowledge which is available right now. Thank you very much. Additional questions, Rivo or Eamon? Yes, thank you. I'm wondering how easy it is to get those independent ground stations on, on your platform. Uh, there are some other players doing the same as, as you intend to do. So I'm wondering how to reach them and, and what's your value prop to them, which is different from the competitors one. Actually, yeah. Uh, our original idea was only to be the broker for existing ground stations. But actually, then we find out that integration can be, as it's not standardized, it can be very tricky. So at first, we are working on our backbone network, which is uh, consisting of our own reliable hardware. And then in parallel, once we have a platform uh, and service uh, ready and, uh, and uh, going, we can onboard the, only the antennas, which will really like to work and be integratable to us uh, just to extend the connectivity. Clarify the question, Rivo. Yes, just to maybe elaborate, I'm wondering how many or what's the percentage or share of the ground stations in the world that would be actually, you know, compatible with, with your solution? Actually, this is exactly what we cannot say because like it's not standardized hardware. 
So it's only about to just uh, approach the, the, the owners, which, is, uh, which are now mostly the radio amateurs. So this is the reason why we cannot start with this. Uh, Michal has a very quick question. Yes, how many stations, how many crowd stations would you need to be able to provide 24-hour service? Uh, I think to cover theoretically like all the uh, all the uh, earth, actually it would be I think maybe 40 ground stations. But it's the all theoretical right. value is not possible. All right, so 40 Thank ground you. stations is the last word from Jakub Lymon. This concludes his Q&A. And we are moving on to the last pitch of tonight, uh, which hails from Ukraine. Valentin Frechka will represent Relief, a company with a special technology that recycles leaves into paper. Hi there, I am Valentin from Relief. Instead of wood, we make the paper from fallen leaves. The opportunity to be a member of Challenger opened a new context for us, which helped to improve the our project and make it more accessible to the market. Like deforestation, the future may seem distant, but it is very close to us. And we have a ready-made solution to stop cutting down trees. That is why we believe that we are worthy of victory because it will bring us closer to the goal. So I believe Valentin is ready, fired up, behind his computer. So Valentin, you can start your pitch right now. Thank you, Christina. Uh, hello, everyone. My name is Valentin. I'm a co-founder of Relief. I'm working on a biotech project that I would like to present you now. Just imagine that 4.1 hectares of forest are cut down every year just for paper production. It's like the whole country of the Netherlands. In this regard, we have developed a new and patented method of producing paper from a bio-waste such as a fallen leaf. The fact is that the leaves are an annual problem for a cities. It falls in a large quantity, clog the savage or tram track, and therefore it needs to be cleaned which is a quite unprofitable and disposable method, usually are not eco-friendly. Our work is based on a city, on a working with such cities. They supply us with the leaves on an annual basis, and then we extract the special fiber from the leaves, finally produce paper and packaging. At this stage, we, uh, it, it's not just an idea. We already produce our products in a partnership with the existing paper mills in Ukraine, and on this stage, our main goal is an investment and growth. Leaf paper products have the same functionality as the wood, but we have achieved the qualities that are unique only to our product. Paper is a waterproof, breathable, and recyclable. To date, cardboard and paper packaging material is about 270 billion euro from the whole packaging market. Non-wood and waste paper, paper packaging production account for 3.1 billion euro. The our goal is to reach the 5% of the non-wood paper packaging market, which is about 150 million euro per year. We make money on selling our paper as a semi-finished product for the eco-conversion companies and selling packaging product with added weather. Combined with technology, solution for cities and paper makers, we make money on the franchise, so the one plan can generate income to $10.8 million for one year. Relief on the market is a perfect example of the stable wood substitute, because the 17 trees can be replaced by 2.3 tons of leaves to produce just a one ton of paper. Such production eliminates the use of chemicals and has a lower emission by 78% than other manufacturers. Our team is a unique, in that it consists of a member with an experience in the file for more than 30 years. We have professional in the finance, management, and the science research. Relief is incredible. The one technology has allowed us to bring a new product to market, save the trees from failing, and make cities clean. So, invest in Relief and save the planet profitably. Thank you so much for your attention. You can find this QR code and find the video from the other production. And I'm ready for the question. 
Thank you very much, Valentine. This was precisely three minutes. What a lovely way to wrap up our pitching sessions. Now to the jury, I will first give the word to Miriana. Yes, hello. Um, Hi. Short question. You said that the, you are relying on the franchise sales model, right? What do you think is the key ingredient yeah. you need to have it there? How you would choose, uh, let's mean? say, geolocation on which you are planning to target the franchise? Uh, geolocation is not very important. The main part is that the uh, weather of, of fallen leaves, the amount of fallen leaves and the, um, the place where it can be collected and used for the whole production. So it's one of the parts for researching which we provide for the, uh, our clients who want to buy a franchise. But you will advise them, I don't know, to do the research, how many woods there is around their location or how you plan to do that. Or just tell them, guys, find how many trees you have in your country. For example, uh, Kiev generates for one season around uh, 200,000 tons of leaves. Uh, we confirmed this. But for example, if someone wants to uh, open the same production in Bratislava, so before this, we need to do uh, together research to uh, learn which volume of leaves are in this uh, uh, region and then start to planning their production for the whole year. Mm -hmm. So basically, can I just yes. ask one more thing? So you are waiting potential customers to approach you and then start doing the research, research instead of potentially trying to find out which are the best possible locations? Uh, it's one of the way of the monetizing of what, I, uh, what, I, what we are offered. The main part is that we produce the paper, analog paper to wood and selling it is. Uh, and combined with this technology and the possibilities to make cities clean, we offer also the one uh, way uh, monetize this uh, franchise. But it's not the main uh, okay. way of the uh, earning money. Excellent. Eamon? Well, as someone who lives in a city where a lot of leaves fall, uh, this sounds uh, very exciting. I'm curious, do the paper mills that you work with have to do any customization or can this work on their existing plant machinery? Uh, we have developed the our technology and optimized the uh, equipment, which we also developed by ourselves. So this is totally patented uh, because the paper production process consists from the three stage. First is uh, getting fiber and then converting into the paper. Paper. So this first we developed by ourselves and protected by ourselves. And the paper production is the same process in whole world. Thank you. And Rivo, the last question. Yes, I'm, I'm wondering about the seasonality of the business because the leaves fall off, you know, during the fall usually. I, However, the demand for, for paper, I guess, is pretty like stable. So I'm, I'm wondering if you can somehow reserve the reserves. Uh, can you repeat? I just don't hear. I had a bit of connection. Yes, I'm wondering about the seasonality of the business because, you know, the leaves, they fall off during the fall. However, I guess, you know, fresh paper is, is, is uh, in demand uh, all the time. So you would need to somehow preserve the leaves or, or how to, what, what's the thing about it? Oh, thank you. That's a good question. Uh, seasonal, seasonality is not a problem. It's not about us because the leaves generate in a lot of, uh, amount and we can uh, collect the amount for the our uh, annual needs because we receive this from cities dry granulate and uh, uh, safe to the our uh, annual production needs so it's not seasonal it's the same with the apple juice you can drink apple juice whole year but apples accessible only on the one season <laughs> Thank you very much, uh, Valentin, for this lovely end. Thank you, Thank you Michal, Miriana, Rivo, and Iman, for your questions. This wraps up the seven startups pitching tonight as part of our first batch of the Challenger Accelerator. Now the jury will disconnect from our virtual studio. 
move themselves to an undisclosed location and deliberate who will be the winner of the main prize, which is, to remind you, an investment opportunity of 250,000 euros provided by the CB Investment Management. And also, it is now going to be your turn, you, the audience, to take up your phones or laptops or what, what have you, and go to Slido. Uh, punch in uh, hashtag demo day and you can start voting for your favorite. You can do it now, you can do it uh, during a short wrap up video we have prepared for you so that you can recall who were the startups pitching tonight and then you might do it for a little bit longer after that. And when we come back, then we were going to welcome in the studio Peter Komornik, CEO and co-founder of Slido, which you will be very familiar with by then, uh, in a discussion with Michaela Kryškova, co-founder of Startup Awards and a former investment manager at Neology Ventures. They will be talking about how Slido has started and how it got acquired by Cisco. But without a further ado, let's recall who are our startups tonight. Challenger Accelerator was a great deep dive into different business topics. In doing so, it allowed us to challenge our own ideas, business and concepts. Our gas detector drastically reduces the cost of farms. With the investment, it would allow us to affect the lives of hundreds of farms just this year and thousands going forward. Hi everyone, my name is Ivan and I'm a co-founder of AgeVault, a Slovak innovative startup based in Bratislava that is on a mission to accelerate mass mobility adoption through our unique EV charging digital ecosystem. Challenger Accelerator was an incredible ride for AgeVault. We got many valuable feedback from local and international mentors, coaches and investors. Thanks to them, we could understand what our moonshot really is and what the EV user needs really are. I believe that AgeVault is the most relevant startup to win this competition. Our vision is not only about e-mobility adoption, but also about energy optimization and thereby helping towards achievement of UN Sustainable Development Goals. This is a fantastic opportunity for an investor to get involved in a sector where the demand for EV charging infrastructure is exponential. The amount of uh, information and knowledge I receive from Challenger is huge. Challenger is an excellent program that helped me to grow personally and to mature our project significantly. We are in the interesting market with huge growth potential. We have MVP, which has been validated by first customers. Our business model is new and unique in our field. I am not saying that everything is obvious and sure for 100% yet, but we have vision and we have will and I believe also abilities to realize it. We learned the difference between running a company and playing a running one. We have found first clients and established an international consortium. We have won 20k and applied for the NL Innovation Lab. I need to quit my job. The second we get invested, I want to get all in. Na Slovensku niektoré firmy vyvíjajú moderné technológie, ktoré môžu preraziť vo svete. Here. Here. There. Here. And at 4500 other places around the globe, people can finally start using the full potential of river power. Thanks to Challenger Accelerator, I have met many interesting people from different fields. I have acquired useful knowledge on how to accelerate the business properly and make an innovative tool that became a final product, attract wider attention and break into the market. We offer innovative and ecological solutions that will ensure self-maintenance of industrial robots. Our idea is not just a tool, 
is a physical product. Thanks to the investment which we need to complete the development and start production, we can accelerate the rapid return of investment and generate profit. Thank you very much for the opportunity to present our company. Thanks to Challenger Workshop and Mentors, we have significantly rebuilt our business plan, we have added subscription model to our service, and we have secured our first two customers. During the acceleration program, we have validated our solution, demonstrated necessary skill set on board, so with an investment, we are ready to speed up customer acquisition and make space more accessible. Hi there, I am Valentin from Relief. Instead of wood, we make the paper from fallen leaves. The opportunity to be a member of Challenger opened a new context for us, which helped to improve our project and make it more accessible to the market. Like deforestation, the future may seem distant, but it is very close to us, and we have a ready-made solution to stop cutting down trees. That is why we believe that we are worthy of victory because it will bring us closer to the goal. Welcome back. I hope you have all cast the vote for your favorite startup. If you haven't done so yet, you can still do it. Go to Slido, use hashtag demo day, then choose, pick, click on the, on the startup that you want to give your vote to. Don't forget to scroll down, hit send, send that vote away so that we can all count them with our little fairies in the background. So do so. Do so now, you have a couple of minutes left. And in the meantime, I would like to welcome here with us on the virtual stage, Peter Komornik, CEO and co-founder of Slido. He personally will be counting those votes afterwards. So, you know, you want to do it now because it's going to take some time. And he's going to be talking with Michala Krišková, co-founder of Startup Awards and a former investment manager at Neology Ventures. They will be talking about Slido's path from startup weekend all the way to an acquisition by Cisco. Now, hello guys and Michaela, the floor is yours. Hi. Hi, Mishka. Hi, everyone. Hi. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, while we thanks Christina for passing the mic. Uh, while we wait to hear the name of the Challenger Demo Day winner. Um, I think it's great that we can actually speak to someone whose journey may have started out in a similar way, minus the 200 plus K investment, I guess, right? <laughs> um, and that, that started nine years ago. Um, it's a great pleasure for me to welcome among us uh, Peter Komornik, um, the CEO of Slido, a Slovak company that went from winning a local startup weekend in 2011, uh, as far as I remember, to being acquired by Cisco this year. Um, I happened to be at that first startup weekend and watched him rehearse his first pitch, the winning pitch. Um, and I've had the opportunity to watch Peter and Slido's story uh, from a bit of a distance now, um, all the way from that startup weekend to 7 million users and close to 1.5 million events worldwide. So I couldn't be happier for Peter's team success. And um, I think we all know how much hard work and self-sacrifice and perhaps even dumb luck is needed to get where you guys got um, uh, now. And um, so Peter, welcome. Um, and so happy to have you here in what I'm sure is a really busy time for you and your team. Um, I'll get right to my first question. Um, Cisco, a global be be behemoth of a, co a company, recently announced acquisition of Slido, uh, a company co-founded 
led since the beginning, um, of which you hold uh, a majority, I think. Um, the price wasn't disclosed, uh, and I'm not going to ask you about that because I know you can't tell, but I'm sure we can all use a multiplication table. Um, how are you feeling right now? <laughs> so <clears throat> thank you, Mishka, and uh, thank you, everybody, for having me here, and, and hello to all our uh, virtual uh, audience. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm feeling pretty great uh, talking to you now virtually uh, on, on, on this stage after long years. I, I just want to kind of correct something. It was not that Startup Week in 2011. It was actually Startup Week in 2012. Uh, but we also participated uh, in, in the Startup Week in 2011. And, uh, and that's where actually I made Ferry, uh, uh, another of our co-founder who then joined us in 2012 and helped us win the Startup Week. And so I think you need to start. You need to start somewhere. You need to lose some. You need to learn your lessons. And, and really like uh, joining that first participant and learning the lessons there has been absolutely critical to then actually going in 2012 and, and, and winning that one. So uh, I think that's, that's maybe one of the first kind of lessons like every time, you know, what seems like, okay, it was this smooth sailing from Startup Weekend to Cisco uh, acquisition and, and hopefully like many years going forward as well. Uh, there are so many kind of bumps and, and failures and lessons and learnings uh, along, along the way, right? And, and it all starts uh, but we don't talk that much about those, right? Uh, we talk about right. the, the, yeah, the acquisition happened. How are you feeling? Uh, yeah, <laughs> but feeling pretty right. good. And, now, it's, and, it's, and it's not the end, right? Because, I mean, I think most people kind of have the impression that once you get acquired by a company, that's, that's the end, and you go off and buy an island uh, in the Caribbean, and that's it for you, right? But um, maybe you could... Just tell us quickly what's what's ahead for you and the team and and the management and basically what's what's the journey ahead for you now. No, absolutely, and I, and I, yes, there are some companies for for who's like after the acquisition, it's it's the end, but definitely not for us. And uh, and to be honest, if you would ask me a year ago, like if we would, you know, you would tell me that in a year Slido I will be acquired, I would tell you like no, no way, come on, like uh, you know, why would we why would we sell the company and and uh, we we didn't really want to sell uh, sell the company, uh, uh, and one of the reasons why we actually decided in India and accepted the offer by Cisco was this really strong kind of alignment uh, of, of vision, like what they are trying to do right now, and especially the the new leader that that came to uh, to Cisco, uh, and the vision of really making virtual meetings ten x better uh, than in person experience and and creating this kind of equal opportunity for people around the world and and really removing all those barriers to. To opportunity, it's such a powerful, powerful kind of vision, and so so much aligned to what we are aspiring uh, that it was very hard to kind of say no to that. And and I think this bigger impact and, and the the ability to really play uh, on a much bigger playground and and be able to pursue this much bigger vision, but still kind of also uh, make sure we deliver on on our promise to customers. That was a big big part of the decision making uh, process. So we stay committed. The whole team remains at at Cisco, and we plan to kind of go forward and. And hopefully in a few years, um, have even more awesome product and, 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 and millions of more customers using Slido uh, every, every day. That was actually my next question. The, the sort of the reasoning behind your decision or making that call to sell the company. Um, let me just uh, tell you what you said in an interview in 2018. I'm sure you remember everything you said to every journalist in your whole life. but. Um, you basically said that you expect to be at the top of the market in 2021. So uh, I think that's, you know, you got that kind of accurate, I think. But you specifically said that um, uh, to, as an answer to a question, what, what's gonna, what, is going to, what is it going to take to get you there? You basically said, well, we just need to get going in the same way, ride the same way, go at the same pace that we're going right now, and I think we'll, uh, we'll get there. Um, but at the same time, you said, you know, that with a caveat that, you know, you're, you're riding a wave, but uh, you can do everything right, but you never know um, what wave you're riding, basically, right? And, and it might just come crashing down. And going back to uh, what you said about the decision to sell, I mean, was, was the COVID pandemic, I mean, I, I'm not trying to tie it to your decision to sell, but, but was COVID a bit of that wave that came crashing down for you guys? And did that have anything to do with that timing of, of the decision? And I think a corollary uh, question to that is, how far could you have taken Slido uh, without Cisco, or without a bigger company uh, mm. as a partner? Just with your own resources that you had at the time, could you could you grow it fivefold, tenfold um, without without Cisco? Mm. 
Uh, that's, <clears throat> that's a great question. I don't remember that interview. Uh, uh, Was in Forbes. Uh, yeah. Especially the metaphor metaphor with waves, I think is very precise here. Where actually COVID for us really increased our usage. Uh, like initially, we had we had as as basically most conferences kind of disappeared. Uh, initially, like we had we had a dip, but uh, like afterwards, we we've seen a pretty kind of strong increase in usage uh, and demand uh, for Slido, especially for smaller meetings. which just kind of the new way for us. And I think the metaphor I used for COVID was. You are kind of, you know, you're you're swimming in this in this sea, and you're paddling, you know, like crazy. You wanna you wanna be uh, uh, in the front with your competitors, and suddenly this kind of huge meteor comes and crashes into the sea, right? And it creates this this tsunami wave of opportunities, but also like distraction. And that's kind of what happened, uh, I think, with with COVID. With some industries were totally damaged, but for some companies it was this crazy opportunity. And some companies were ready for the wave, like when you're surfing, you know, when you're, when you're in a good position and you are brave enough to jump on a wave, you can, you can go like crazy, right? And that's what we tried to do as well. And I think this new wave, uh, we will see the virtual events, virtual meetings will definitely be a huge part of our future going forward. Even when we come to the office, uh, it will be a huge trend and it will really be shaping our working lives going forward. And I think, uh, Obviously, like those those virtual video meetings platforms, they will almost become uh, like a future platform of the future work of collaboration. And what we realized as we as this kind of COVID situation happened, that for Slido to succeed, we need to really integrate very closely with those tools, and the ability to integrate, uh, not just integrate with with, with WebEx, uh, but actually be able to you know get access inside WebEx and be able to leverage the full power of the platform. That can allow us to create a completely like different different impact and, and, and experience for for our users <clears throat> and and yes even like another kind of thing we realized especially with COVID uh, as these waves started kind of going and investors started going crazy and started approaching all these companies in the space also we were offered like many many VCs approached us and we started talking to some VCs and what we realized was that we can't just continue bootstrapping as we were going before. And if we want to really achieve our aspiration, we would have to partner with someone, whether another company or uh, or a VC. And we started actually talking to to several VC investors uh, from from the US and and started to kind of look to to raise the round. So that was actually the goal. Still in the fall of, of last year, the goal and the ambition was to raise uh, raise a series. I don't know what what it's called right now, but to raise some some uh, some money to actually fuel our growth, hire hire more people in the team, and really kind of pursue the opportunity and ride that wave. Uh, but then when Cisco came and, and actually agreed to to give us the resources, agreed to keep the team and the product uh, on our trajectory as well, but at the same time give us access to the platform and integrate into into WebEx, uh, that was just uh, like a really really great great opportunity for us. That obviously it's risky, any acquisition is risky, but the the, the potential for impact and the the opportunity is just just immense. So we we, we took the chance. And now we need to roll like crazy. <laughs> yeah, I, I had a question about external funding because I, I, because I think your your story is a bit unusual, um, at least for, well, I guess there's a lot of bootstrapped startups in, in C, but probably not your size. And um, you you actually built, you know, I don't want to say the size, but like a huge business, which is sort of maybe one or two rounds of angel investment and... Um, not not a very sizable one for for the size of the company that you built, and um, I'm just wondering was there was there a time when you made a decision to turn down external money along the way that was uh, sort of being pushed to you, and are you happy now with that decision, or what's your view uh, when you look back at that? Yeah, I think you know initially one of the learnings for me also along the way was that. Initially, like when you get into this industry, the VCs are perceived as these kind of huge mentors and and like people who seen it all and know it all. So you respect their opinions very. I would know very much <laughs> uh, initially, and and the the kind of more you go along the journey, you realize that there are some VCs who are incredible and and really they've seen a lot, and then there are other VCs who maybe haven't seen that much. Uh, and one of the things which I think many young startups face, and and definitely it was case for me. Uh, and that's, I think, one of the reasons why we tried to raise VC initially was it was almost this kind of external validation because initially, like you have, you don't know, like your product, you have the first customers, it's kind of working, but is it really the right thing? Is it growing fast enough? You know, like you have so many doubts, 
and and uh, the the VC like if a good VC invests in you, it's almost this kind of validation. Yes, you're doing a good job. You're on the right track. And I think many startups and many founders are kind of seeking this, but it's exactly the wrong reason, right? To to raise VC money, you should only raise the money if it's going to kind of accelerate you on your vision. If you know exactly how you want to <clears throat> how you want to use it. And and they're the kind of one of the best metaphors I heard for the VC money. It's almost like a drug. And when you're running a marathon, yes, you can take a drug and you can actually finish faster if you know what you're doing. But if you don't know what you're doing, you know, after a few kilometers, you can you can die. And that's what happens to many startups who kind of don't know what to do, right? And they don't realize it's it's a marathon and they they overdose basically with the VC money and don't don't finish the race. Uh, and I think that's I, I'm joking that I was too bad at pitching to actually raise <laughs> the money. But the truth is like we had some good conversations along the way. But whenever I realized like how much work and how much time it would take at the time to actually really finish the funding and what it would mean for the company, we always decided to basically raise the money from the customers and, and just kind of go and sell Slido. And, and we were very lucky that we were quite break even quite early, almost like 2015. I think spring was the first month. I remember that, that moment, like April 2015, when we first time like kind of broke even uh, in a month. And we were basically able to always grow the company with revenue, which uh, I think it was the best thing. And we would need to raise the VC money now if we would not make the acquisition. But I think it was a good decision not to raise it earlier. Um, I, I, have, I have so many questions, but um, I think we only have about five minutes. So um, I, I'm, I'm just going to go back to this one memory I have because I, w I was going to ask about the initial idea, but uh, I'm just going to skip to scalability because you mentioned you were lucky to be profitable quite early. And I think you had a nice product that your customers saw sort of a, a benefit in and wanted to buy it. But um, did you worry about scalability at some point? Because I remember... <laughs> Seeing, um, seeing you guys at Pioneers Festival, uh, this I don't, for some people who may not be familiar with this, it was at the time a huge event, great exposure. It was uh, multiple stages. All the you know big U.S. investors or many of them were there, and I have this memory. It must have been about 2014, 2015, seeing your co-founder and at that time a C-level exec sort of manning the equipment at one of the stages and sort of watching every waking hour and making sure that things go s smoothly. And I kept sort of thinking to myself, like, these guys really have a nice product and they have customers, but how the hell are they going to get to scale when, you know, if they have to man every event? And I know the, the sort of the reasoning behind that was that you guys have to make sure that the big events go really well and um, so that you get traction and interest. But but did you worry about scalability at, at one point or another um, to, you know, to make sure that you actually build a, a sustainable uh, SaaS model? We <clears throat> we did, and we had uh, like scalability is kind of you can look at scalability in multi -way, multiple ways, right? And the first scalability kind of scars that I, I carry are from also like these bigger events where we were thinking, okay, the product works, it's working nice, and then this bigger event came. I was, you know, maybe introducing Slido on the stage or sitting in the backstage kind of supporting next to the event organizer and suddenly Slido crashed because just too many people kind of joined, right? And there are just too many of those cars along the way where like suddenly you're surprised by something that didn't work out. And definitely the early years, <clears throat> we had so many failures where almost it makes you wonder like, okay, will we ever make the product stable enough? Will we ever, you know, like, will it ever work um, well enough? And I think one of the reasons, one of the big reasons why we actually loved going to these events was not just to support them. Obviously, we wanted that relationship. We wanted to make sure it will work well. So we only went to these selected events. But at the same time, it was the priceless, like, it was the most priceless feedback you could, you could get. Like being there with the customer, kind of managing the tool, it was the best customer feedback. And, and most of the kind of innovative ideas we had was thanks to being there in, in the trenches, seeing like, ah, oh, this doesn't work well. Ah, oh, we need to change this in the product. You know, like this, this almost like physical intimate pain that you feel when you are in the trenches there. That was the best thing. And I think uh, we were very lucky that actually we were in this industry where it was normal and actually appreciated that we went there. We could be there in the trenches with the customers. And I think every startup should try to find a way how to, especially in the early years, be in the trenches with the customers and uh, and understand how they're using the tool and, and continuously improve it. But even going forward, I think that was one of the learning and, and mistake we've done as we grew bigger and as we started scaling and as we got beyond 100, 100 people and so on. And the customer base kind of expanded. I think it was easy 
like once you get a little bit farther away from customers, it's easy kind of to lose the touch and, and it's easy to not see all the new use cases, all the kind of new pains, all the new ways that customers are using your tool. And I think you have to be extremely careful as you're growing fast, not to assume that, okay, you know it, you've seen it, you're talking to some of the older customers right now. Be always curious, always, always search for uh, like the new ways your customers are using your tool and always learning like how you can make the experience uh, better. So that would be probably one one learning, like don't ever get comfortable with, with how much time you spend with your customers and don't ever assume you understand them like you don't, you don't. Um, I have a question about, because I mean, it's company culture uh, is sort of a buzzword now. Uh, and, um, you know, we all know it eats strategy for breakfast, as Peter Drucker famously put it. But um, what does it actually mean to a CEO uh, in a day to day? Um, as a founder, I mean, how do you know what type of culture you want to build for your company? How do you know who fits, who doesn't fit in that type of culture that you want to build and in the end how would you describe the culture that slido um sort of revolves around mm. and i have to say like for me the, the the culture is the most important thing uh in the company and we were very very intentional from the beginning about it like the i remember the, the second day we came to spot after the startup weekend we kind of put a, a poster on on the wall where we wrote those kind of core principles or core values that we want to build the company by what, what were they our, our, so at the time there were five. So it was uh, it was like the three that we still have, like the three core values. It was simply clever, like the way we want to build the product, we want to solve the problems, we want to you know talk to the customers. So we, we stole that from Skoda. <laughs> then the second one, <laughs> second one was uh, we care, we care about our customers, about each other, about the community. And then the third one was don't stop to grow, to learn, to innovate. And then we had two more, which we thought like were also kind of core, fundamental. But I think they were just really important at the beginning. And there was like 80-20 was one. It was like, you know, that's part of the rule. Like make sure that you you aim for the biggest impact with the, with the minimum kind of uh, energy to, to maximize the learning. <clears throat> and then the last one uh, was was actually win-win. Like, and I think we kept that one, but uh, it's almost like this this implicit value uh, within, within the VCare and within, within Slido. But this win-win approach in business that always aim for a win-win uh, solution, win-win relationships with, with customers. And, and we still have it, like one of the kind of guiding principles we have in Slido is like focus on the success of your customers and the rest will follow. So don't focus on money, don't focus on all the metrics, really focus on making your customers successful and everything else will kind of fall, fall in place. Uh, and and we, we, we took those values very, very kind of seriously from the beginning. We use it when we were hiring people uh we everyone in the company knows those values and, and we really use those values to kind of guide our our day-to-day -day decision making and i think where it came from where i where i realized the kind of really critical importance of, of building the culture and those values was uh actually having the chance to be in google before and working with raster mm -hmm. and the team there which also kind of shaped my thinking and understanding of, of building a great team but also before i played a lot of sports a lot of team sports and i knew exactly which you know, players I want on my team, which I don't, and what it takes to build a winning team. And it's, again, it's all about creating that culture, that that magical kind of, you know, energy among, among the people that, that just allows them to, to go and push forward. So it's absolutely critical. And I think many startups underestimated at the beginning don't, like, make very, very clear from the beginning how you want to be building the business, even though it seems like, okay, what are we talking about? Uh, I think it was one of the most important things we, we have done at the beginning. Um, and I think I rela related to that is because the culture is set by the founder. And I think that is critical, at least for the first few years of any company, um, sort of the founder's personality. And I, I mean, we're sort of reading the great stories about the great founders. And, you know, I think there is some um, something called a, a, or something that I would call a founder DNA or sort of some, some mix of genes or, you know, per personality traits that kind of mix well to, prepare someone to be a good founder. Um, uh, and I think everyone gets there in their unique way. And I'm not saying that, you know, this is a perfect recipe for, for getting there, but um, I think in some ways it's a, it's a delicate sort of balancing act between sort of a stubborn pursuit of your vision and uh, the judgment and the ability to take good advice, not bad advice, but good advice. Mm -hmm. And I'm just wondering if you ever actually went against your own instinct and your own sort of vision uh, and took someone's advice and with what results 
Yes, and I think there was another really good learning in the early, like in the first year. I really tried to talk to a lot of people in the startup kind of ecosystem in Slovakia. Amazing people, really smart people that gave me great advice. But they, like, I think one of the key learnings, especially in the in the early years, that I realized was, like, there will be a lot of really well intentioned people that will that will want that will want to give you advice and that will want to help you. But it's your job to make sure that you only take the advice that's relevant for you, right? And you have to realize that those people probably spend like one hour when they're talking to you, thinking about your business, but you spend breathing and sleeping and, and thinking about it like, you know, 24 hours a day. And uh, the best advice, uh, so many of those people, they gave me some advice. I followed some after a week or two. You, you just feel it doesn't make sense. You just feel it's wrong, especially from people that you really respect, like some successful entrepreneurs, you know, who build a great company. They give you this advice, you follow their steps and, and you just know like, really? But you, you, you follow it because, you know, you really respect them. And after, and actually that happened to us uh, with one, one um, great mentor that, that, that gave us, that told us the story, how they built their company and, and, and what we should do. And, and I kind of followed in the steps and after three months and, and, and wasting quite a lot of money on that advice, I realized like, no, this is, this is definitely not going to work and, and I'm going to kill the company this way. And uh, the best advice, I think, if you want if you want to kind of recognize the best advice, always aim for people who build a similar business in a similar kind of segment or in a, with a kind of similar dynamic. So for for us, one of the best mentors initially was Adam from Prezi, which had very similar business model, very similar kind of trajectory from Central Europe to the US. And I think for the first two or three years, their journey was really almost like a roadmap for us, like what do we need to do, and we followed that the journey and has been has been really great. And that even Bride and and, and Slag and, and Zoom and, and many other like these businesses that inspire you and that are world class, like you want to learn from them, you admire the way how they do things. So you know, okay, there is someone that you can learn from and, and their advice is probably relevant for your circumstances. Doesn't mean the others are not smart. It's just like their advice is probably good advice for someone else's business, but not for your business. And you have to be very yeah. careful about it. That was a, that was a tough lesson. <laughs> like, yeah, I couldn't agree more. Um, unfortunately, we only have um, a minute or two. So one last question, Peter. Uh, I'm sure we'll have more opportunities to talk later. Um, if you were to step out of your CEO shoes now and sort of look at your story from a journalist's point of view and maybe sort of look at the Slido story from a point of view of the Slovak ecosystem or the C ecosystem, um, startup ecosystem, there's uh, Expo now that also announced um, a successful exit recently. Um, what does this handful of a few successful startups does uh, do for a small country like Slovakia or the startup ecosystem? And what do you think uh, Slido will do for the Slovak ecosystem or what you hope that it will um, mean for, for the future of the ecosystem going forward? So it's, it's funny, but one of the reasons why we actually like why I was so passionate about starting Slido and building it the way we did was exactly because I was missing those role models and those kind of inspiration here in Slovakia. And it was not such about only about the inspiration, but about the lessons and learnings uh, that, that you can get from, from those stories, right? So one of the key values, as I said, like we care about the communities, exactly like sharing those lessons that we learn out there working with some of the top, top clients and, <clears throat> and listening to some of the kind of top thought leaders is exactly like we want to bring it back here. We want to share it with the, with the community, and we're trying to do it. And definitely want to do it, do it uh, even more. And uh, I think this is absolutely critical to make sure that that companies here are sharing those stories. And uh, and hopefully that's also uh, like my hope is that you know in ten years, like no one knows, you know what will happen with Slido. Hopefully it will be another kind of a great continuation of the story. But I think the real and true legacy of, of Slido is the great, amazing people that that, that met here and, 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 and their lessons, their stories, and, and what they will be able to achieve uh, within Slido, but also outside of Slido afterwards. And I hope that will be the, the real legacy of our story, also of Exponea story. And that's how we start building the ecosystem. I think we are still very, very early. We need more and more of those stories. So I'm really fingers crossed for all the guys speaking today, uh, all, all the startups out there. Uh, fingers crossed, guys, approach me if we can help in, in, in some way. Uh, and, and really let's make sure we, we start building this community and ecosystem here. Peter, thanks for your time and your uh, great answers. And um, that's all from us now. And I have to pass the mic back to Christina to the studio. Bye guys. Thanks for having me. Bye. Thank you guys. 
Thanks for coming. Thank you, Peter. Thank you, Michala, for this lovely discussion. And I believe the birdies in the studio have told me that now we do know which of the seven startups is a little bit closer to be on the same path of success as Slido. So let's get to the winners. So, at this point, I would like to welcome with me on the stage first Eva Šimekova, Associate Partner at Civita Slovakia. Hello. Hi, Kika. Hi, everyone. Hello, nice to have you here. And also Michal Nešpor, Founder, Co-Founder, Partner at CB Investment Management and also your Hi, feared ladies. juror. Hello, Michal. So, now we are here and all of us. And uh, I will first turn my attention to Eva. Who are you wearing tonight? Um, actually, a dress and proper shoes after a very long time. So how rare and good. how beautiful <laughs> yes. that you have dressed up for us tonight. But without any further delays, I will just ask you, how long did it take to count all the votes? Well, since uh, uh, Peter Komornik did not help me because he was busy uh, with the fireside chat, but luckily we have Slido, so it didn't take long. Uh, we received 555 votes, which is an amazing number, and I know the winner. Oh, so, okay, I will shut up now, and you can let us know who is the winner of People's Choice Award. Okay, so the race was tight, and the Oscar goes, oh, the People's Choice Awards goes to Ediris. Ediris! Congratulations! <laughs> Congratulations, Christian Kredatus and his Ediris team. You may now say a couple of words. How are you feeling? Wow, um, yeah, I'm incredibly humbled, honestly, given the fact uh, how high quality the competition is. Uh, this is really something great for us. I'm, I'm super happy. Thank you very much to Civita. Thank you for organizing not only this event, but the whole challenger, I have to say, it was super high global quality. I like to know that this is something that we all can look forward once we perhaps come back home to Slovakia, <laughs> if we are still not there. So thank you very much. Super, super good news for us. So congratulations, uh, Christian Kredatos and the uh, Ediris team. Just to remind you, they have won a service package uh, comprised of uh, services from Civita, from the spot, co-working space, and from the law firm Majerniga Mihalikova. And uh, we are also quite happy because now they are going to be our neighbors at the spot. But now, my attention turns once again. Ooh, Michal is here. <laughs> Michal, how are you feeling? How was the deliberation? It was brutal. Brutal. There was a huge fight. People got disconnected on LinkedIn. Yeah, uh, they it was ugly. It got really ugly. Yeah. You've been in many juries, and this one was the most violent, so thank <laughs> God it was only virtual. But uh, what are you here to tell us? I'm here to tell you the winner of uh, the Challenger Accelerator 2021. But before I do so, um, I would like to also announce that, similar to last year, where we actually picked the winner uh, out of the Accelerator program, but uh, at the end, invested in three companies. Um, we will do so in a similar way this year as well. There can only be one winner, but uh, on behalf of CB Investment Management, we will be talking to more of you out of the Accelerator program, which I think is uh, uh, very good news for you. This is excellent news, and it also shows that I was not lying to them when I said it can happen. Yeah. All right, so now to announcing the winner. Unfortunately, there can only be one. Um, so the winner of the 2021 Challenger Accelerator and the congratulations go to Christian from Ediris. And 
I'm sorry now you have to come up with a whole new speech because we don't want to hear the same stuff. So, congratulations. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, again, I have to say I'm speechless. Uh, this is a, a super good sign for us. I am just hope that this is not the last time uh, that uh, you people hear about us. We will do everything that is in it, our power and we'll continue on doing so and putting so much effort into that. Thank you very much. And shout out to all the other startups because I know that they all put crazy hours and crazy energy into that. Thank you very much. <laughs> So congratulations to Christian and the Ediris team. And again, congratulations to all of the startups that have participated, that have found the courage to be here tonight on this virtual stage. It was not easy, but they have done a tremendous job. Congratulations, yes, to Ediris, because they have taken both of the prizes. But as Michal said, there is more winners to come. And we will keep you informed as to who were those. So now, congratulations, and thank you all for pitching. So here we conclude the first year of the Challenger Accelerator, the year of 2020 and 2021. Only virtually, we have never met any of these guys, but we hope that hopefully this year we can have some sort of get together and celebrate their hard work and their successes, not only in the Challenger Accelerator, but also beyond. The innovative solutions that they have presented here are a key puzzle piece to tackling the challenges connected with the effects and the causes of climate change. But not only that, they also contribute to our common, better, sustainable future. We are hoping to see these innovations in our barns, on our roads, and in our factories. And the Book of Challenger is do not done writing yet. The organizers now direct their eye to new challenges in Slovakia, but also abroad. Already in Košice this year, this spring, we are launching Challenger for Urban Creatives. And in Ukraine and Estonia, Challenger Accelerators for Artificial intelligence challenges and for diversity challenges are at works and we will keep you informed on our social media and through our newsletter. Finally, we of course have to thank all our coaches, mentors, workshop leaders, all the guests at all the talks and events we had had. We thank the startups for their hard work, the jury for their input and partners for their continuous support. Praise belongs also to the technical crew right now, right here, and also to all the other crews for all the other events that we had had. And we thank you, the audience, for voting, for participating, for being interested in innovations, startups, and all the things connected. Thank you for watching, and have a good night.